Hello everyone, welcome and good morning. Uh, we have Tim Flink here for uh, the Using AI and ML to Process Open QA Test Results Workshop. So, take it away. I managed, I managed to break my slides in the last 10 minutes. I'm not really sure how. I hope this is not indicative of the rest of the presentation. Um, I'm just, yeah, hopefully not breaking it directly, but we'll see. We'll see. Um, so, uh, my name's Tim, um, and I'm gonna be talking about um, something we've been working on, or something I've been working on for a while, um, which is using some AML techniques to process test results from OpenQA. Please work. Yeah, this is going real well. All right, so, in terms of indications of how this is going to go, all right, let's hope this, this is the end. All right, so what I'm looking to do is do a bit of introduction of you know, what um, the, the situation is around how this got started. Um, talk about, you know, could this actually work? Could it be practical? And leave some end, uh, hopefully at the end, for questions. So as a bit of introduction, um, OpenQA. OpenQA is a system that was created and still maintained by the SUSE folks, but Fedora um, has come to rely very heavily on it. Um, and we also participate uh, upstream. OpenQA is a system that is primarily based on computer vision. Um, so it, uh, there are other things it can do, but the, the real core um, work loop that it does is it looks for a little image in a big image and makes decisions based on whether it does or doesn't find that image. As an example, um, this could be a kind of test step where, you know, if you find Firefox logo, you know, move the mouse to where you found it and uh, simulate a click event. Um, and, you know, these kind of test steps are uh, the, the basis upon which most OpenQA tests are built. Um, because this is a more, a more visual system, the results it comes up with are a little different than uh, than uh, some other, what other test systems uh, can come up with. Um, of course, it's gonna have a, you know, status, did it pass, did it fail, um, uh, logs from both the test running and the system under test, um, but then we get into some of the more interesting parts. Um, so it will, every time it makes one of those comparisons, you know, like the last side where it says, you know, can, you know if you find the Firefox uh, logo, you know, move the mouse to it, it will take a screenshot and record that screenshot. So um, you have screenshots um, of the graphical output of the system under test um, every time a comparison is made, and you have a sequence of screenshots that really represent the whole test um, and everything that has happened during that test. There's also a video of the test process. Um, because these are all virtual machines, it will create a video you know, from the moment the virtual machine under, that's the, the test machine is turned on to when it's turned off. Um, but for what I'm talking about today, I'm most interested in these screenshots. So classifier, when I say classifier, it's pretty much what it sounds like. You know, given an input, what does it belong to? Um, very similar to the idea of a CAPTCHA, um, where, you know, you are trying to classify these little images as, you know, does it have a crosswalk, does it not have a crosswalk? Um, and that's a very good example and something I imagine we've all seen of a uh, binary image classifier. So getting more into the problem we're trying to solve is um, Fedora's OpenQA runs a lot of jobs. Um, the last I had looked, we were running about 1,700 per day, and the failures from those jobs, all that triage is done by two people, um, both of whom have plenty of other things to be doing. And the, the premise going into this is if we can make this triage more efficient, if we can get machines to help um, lighten that load, those people have more time to do other things that aren't just, you know, stare at open QA failures for a good chunk of their day. How many failures per day is that? That's, to, that's the number of jobs per day. Um, I want to say, I mean, it really depends on if something, oh, the question was um, how many failures per day, it was basically how many failures per day. Um, Adam, do you have a better answer to that than I do? I was, on, on average, I think what I was seeing was 20, 20 to 30 a day. But 
Right. And just repeating what it said for the folks who are watching, um, the, the person doing most of the triage said that new failures, um, one to two per day, but it is not a smooth average. There are a lot of spikes. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, the idea is really um, there are only so many atoms, and uh, by making his job more efficient, he can uh, do more things. So putting it into a single sentence, um, the problem statement is really, can we use um, AML techniques in an automated system to reduce the load on the people who are doing the open QA triage work? And the first part of this is, could this possibly work? Um, we uh, kind of stumbled into an opportunity about two years ago. Um, there was an issue in our open QA instance that was causing tests to fail. The failure, while you know you can make an argument that all you know test failures are relevant, it was not relevant to the things we were trying to test at the time, um, and was causing problems. It was a weird failure in that um, it was some interaction that, that we never figured out um, between X and Firefox, where Firefox would just die in the middle of things, and all the visual comparisons would break. It wouldn't make. It, there were no log messages in textual format. The only indication was that you would be dumped to a terminal, um, and uh, there was a graphical message. Uh, I mean, the, the there was text on the screen, but it didn't show up in any logs. It only showed up in the graphical output. Um, and the triage, uh, basically what we were doing was um, multiple times a day, um, Adam was going through and uh, finding these uh, jobs that had failed due to the single root cause and rescheduling them until they either um, passed or failed to a different, uh, more relevant issue. Um, and so the, you know, I say this is a, you know, stumbled into it. It is a situation where we were able to do a cheap experiment um, because the, the um, it's biased towards uh, visual information. And the most expensive part of any machine learning experiment is getting your data together and getting your data set. So um, because you know, people were going through and doing the triage work, they had already done the work I would need experts for. If they rescheduled something, well, it was in the reschedule class. If they didn't reschedule it, you know, it was not reschedule class. Um, so basically had a data set for this experiment that was incredibly cheap. You know, there's a valid question of whether it's safe to assume that all jobs rescheduled were, or all failures that were rescheduled were because of this. Um, I'd argue that it was good enough for what we're trying to do. Um, the, you know, the way that, that updates work in Fedora is in order to go from updates testing to stable, um, either all the tests have to pass or you have to do it manually because things were being triaged multiple times a day and pushing and waiving tests is kind of a pain. Um, and most packagers aren't going to say, oh, they're a failed test. I don't care. I'm going to push it anyway. That's not a common thought process. Um, I think it's a pretty safe assumption for, you know, what we're doing, which is, you know, looking for the simplest possible experiment to answer the question of could this work? Um, this is still true, but definitely at the time there wasn't much research. There wasn't much... Um, you know, talked about using visual information to classify test results. So it was an open question of, is this possible? Is there enough information in these open QA screenshots to even, you know, do the triage that we want to do? Um, and, you know, if the simple experiment, it, you know, can't work with a data set that's basically dumped in our laps, it's probably not worth, you know, the effort and expense to, you know, make this a bigger, more practical experiment um, and spend the money on creating that data set. The idea was to, you know, take, we have our data set of, thing, of failures that were rescheduled, weren't rescheduled. Um, we're trying to classify the failed jobs, like, going in. So we have, okay, these are failures. I want the classifier to determine whether this needs to be rescheduled or not um, with just the screenshots. Keeping the theme of simplicity, just went with a very simple model, trained from scratch, um, and uh, just to, again, keep it simple. Um, the big variable was the size of images. Um, and, you know, one type of input, uh, or we did, I did two experiments, one with uh, images that were twice the size. 
So in terms of results, this actually did a lot better than I thought it was going to. Given the simplicity of the experiment, I would have been happy with, you know, 80% accuracy. Um, but, you know, this got over 90% accuracy. The recall isn't quite as high as I would have liked, but like I said, for an experiment that was meant to uh, show, you know, could this work, I think these are promising. I think the big thing of note is that um, the results, the, like the green is the, uh, the, the single resolution size images, the red is the double resolution images. So there is a slight um, increase in performance, but if you look at the, the runtime, we went from 18 minutes to run the experiment to an hour and a half. So with that slight increase in performance came a hefty cost in uh, computation time. For this use case, I'd argue it's worth it. Um, because you know, if this was if this was going to be something in production, we wouldn't be training every day or every hour or that kind of stuff. We'd be training at most once a week, once every couple of weeks. And if I can spend an extra hour in computer time to you know be more accurate in, or to be able to rely on these results of do you, you know do you need to actually look at those failures? I think that in this particular situation, um, that's a good enough trade-off to do. You have a question? Um, so the question was, um, you know, with 90% accuracy, does that mean it is letting through um, the, the, that 10%? Um, it means uh, accuracy is a combination. So um, like what it, precision is when, um, ah, crap, I, gotta, I always get precision and recall mixed up. One of them is false negatives, one of them is false positives. Accuracy is a combination of either it classified something as rescheduled that didn't need to be rescheduled and um, things that it didn't classify as rescheduled but should have been. Um, the, in this case, okay, now, sorry, I, I, I swear every time I do this, I have to go look up the difference between precision, precision and recall to remember which one's which. Precision is, um, is uh, you know, the high precision means you are not, um, you, or you are, huh, now you've caught me, now I'm questioning myself. Um, but I want high recall, uh, basically, is what, from this, uh, is what I had thought of this, which is why I want the recall to be higher, because if there's high recall, it means you're not missing anything. You might be rescheduling jobs that don't need to be rescheduled, but for this use case, I don't care. I'm trying to minimize human time. Um, but yeah, the accuracy is a combination of that. Um, the precision is if it's, um, you know, uh, the, yeah, I just remember I wanted high recall, and now I'm sitting here and I'm forgetting the, the terms. I'm sorry. Uh, the question was about um, the data set. It is a bi it's just two classes. Just two classes. So it's a binary I, classifier. I had a problem. I, I did, did this recently, and what I had to do to make this work was I had to make a custom learning rate scheduler to make it speed up the slow down the learning dynamically. Mm. Okay. And he was talking about uh, an experience he had with changing some of the details of how an experiment worked. Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to. I'm sorry, I'm trying to summarize for the microphone. Yeah. Um, but I am. Uh, this presentation is really tight on time as I went. So, if uh, there are no more questions, I want to keep going uh, to make sure I don't run out of time too badly. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so, uh, you know, this is just looking at. Uh, there was a lot of computer time. Um, between the two experiments, it was 570 hours of uh, running on machines with GPUs. Like I said, I think these results were good. Um, could they have been, you know, could I improve these, you know, with more iteration, with more tweaking, with, you know, using, uh, you know, more advanced techniques that aren't, 20, you know, 10, 20 years old? Probably, but it's not worth it um, for this particular experiment. The way I like to, you know, think of it is getting back to the um, CAPTCHA example. You know, pretend for a second you could train a bird to solve a CAPTCHA and you spend all these months to get it to work on the crosswalk CAPTCHA and it can, you know, get its 
perfect on it identifies this is a crosswalk, this is not a crosswalk, and it's working great. And then you get the next CAPTCHA that's trying to find a bus. Well, now you, what do you do? Start over and spend the next couple of months retraining the same bird or finding another bird to train to deal with buses. Um, and it kind of gets back to the purpose of this. Um, while it's promising, this was never meant to be practical. It was really meant to answer, to take a cheap data set and answer the question of, is this worth more research? And I think that was a yes. So we move on to phase two from could this work to could this actually work in a useful way and be practical? So the problem statement for phase two is can we actually cluster open QA failures by root cause? Um, when I say that, uh, the idea is, you know, looking at all the failures and giving some indication of, hey, these five failures are probably the same root cause. These other two are probably the same cause. And the, what we get out of doing that is that the people going to triage, uh, to triage these don't have to say, you know, go into five different things with fresh eyes, you know, trying to figure out if they're even the same. You know, they might only have to triage one of the five, or they have five examples to, you know, get information that they use to figure out what the actual root cause was. On top of that, it's a, it could be a rough metric. You know, if you start getting huge failure clusters after, you know, there's a, a system D update, it's a good indication that something has gone horribly wrong um, on top of, you know, probably large numbers of failures. And for phase two, um, not limiting to just the screenshots. Again, the phase, phase one was, could this be useful? Phase two is, or I mean, could, uh, could this actually work? Now we're trying to make it useful and let's not, you know, handicap the thing anymore than we need to. Again, there's not been a ton of research out there on using visual information to classify test results. Um, there has been some, most of it's in the mobile space. Um, there is a paper that was put out in 2021. Interestingly enough, it came out of RIT. Um, that was about combining visual and textual information. It was videos of people testing a mobile app and logs, and they came up with a system to then find the duplicate failures of all of those um, submitted videos and logs. It's not quite what I'm looking to do, but it's close enough that I'm looking at it as a place to get started. But then we start getting into data. So instead of two weeks of data that I did for phase one, I'm looking at three months of data. So over 150,000 jobs, um, over a terabyte of raw data, and now we get to the expensive part, which is processing. In order to you know, train and get machine learning to work, you have to have input for it to learn on. Um, and in general, that's going to be stuff that is you know, tr uh, classified and processed by humans. Traditionally, uh, that all needs to be done up front. So you need to have all your data processed, you need to have all of your examples before you start um, the training process, and every time you do the training process, it forgets everything it's ever done and starts over from scratch. For that, you know, we need hundreds of examples um, at a minimum um, to actually have a chance of getting a model that could do something. And we could do human experts to do this, but as I've mentioned, one of the problems is we don't have many human experts. In fact, we have two of them. And I've been told by good sources that human experts don't react well if you lock them in a room and force them to classify job results for a day or two. <laughs> um, I, haven't, I haven't experimented on this yet to figure out if that's actually the case, but I have it on good authority that that, that may not end well for me. Um, so another part of this that we're looking into, or that I want, that I'm going to do, is iterative learning, which is a modification of um, the traditional machine learning process, where instead of needing all of your data up front and forgetting everything every time you restart the training, you do training in a iterative process. So you get a few examples and then have it start, uh, you know, producing classification results, and it's. Probably not going to be good to start with, but you know, then instead of you know locking someone in a room and forcing them to do all the classification work, you know, maybe every day, every week, you give them ten more, and they can, and you, they can say, okay, this is a good answer, this is a bad answer, this is a good answer, this is a bad answer, and that information is fed back into the training process, and because the training is iterative, um, the 
uh, you know, you don't, you can get hopefully the same results, same type of results had you locked someone in a room and forced them to do all the classification work, but it's done more over time. Like I said, one of the big, you know, advantages of this is I don't have a citation for this, but I claim that nine out of ten experts prefer not being locked into rooms and forced to work. But the other big advantage I see coming from this is that it will adapt to changes better. So if we, have, if we get all of our data from one point in time, that's going to encompass a certain number of failures. If this, if first, if this works, if this starts becoming useful, um, I expect it to start have you know, some troubles over time as things change. By having an iterative training process, um, we can keep up with that change without having to worry about, you know, again, starting over and getting a whole bunch of new data and a whole bunch of new training. So phase two, um, and this is, um, you know, more general, use more data, and to uh, use the iterative training to keep things relevant, to keep performance up, and not have Adam try to kill me. And that's basically where we are. This is a, you know, we're just starting phase two. Um, and uh, hopefully next block I will have more, I will have data from that instead of, hey, this is, you know, kind of what worked and this is where we're going. Any questions? Thank you. I looked it up. Perfect precision means no false positives. Perfect recall means no false negatives. That's not a question, but I do have a question, which yeah. is, um, as you said there, weren't, there wasn't much published research on this particular thing. Mm -hmm. Have you um, considered finding someone like um, Red Hat's collaboratory with Boston University or someone who would be interested in you know, making a paper out of this as part of the project? Um, the question was, uh, I suppose you have the microphone, I may not need to repeat it, was um, you know, whether I'd looked at having this published, yes. Um, when I did my graduate work, my advisor was not interested in it because it was software engineering and he was a computer scientist. Um, there, one of the people on my committee was interested, um, but I wanted to finish. I don't know if phase one eno is enough to publish on its own, um, kind of waiting for phase two. So yes, but not actively yet. I've been kind of waiting for it to finish more. Next question. Uh, I, uh know about a solution called report portal I think you are aware also it has the labeling capacity of uh, the failures uh, in three buckets like if it is an automation failure or it is a product failure or there is third category as well so how this classification will be different uh, from that classification are you talking about the TFA stuff? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, the, it depends on which way you want, I can answer this in a couple of different ways. Um, it is, that is a different, I mean they're both machine learning, um, that works all off of text information and um, like you had said that puts the, the goal of that particular project is to put things into three buckets. They want to know whether it is an actual failure, I think the primary thing is, is this an actual failure or is this the system screwed up and you know a sysadmin or someone who's doing, you know, needs to look at it instead of a genuine test failure. Um, the phase two of this, I'm looking to cluster um, failures by um, their failure type. So instead of just saying, I mean, part of it could be, you know, is it the automation system? Is it the genuine test failure? But the more important thing I'm looking for is I want a group of things that are related. So it is doing a classification problem, but instead of trying to figure out uh, um, you know, whether it's an automation failure or not, it's trying to find things that are related. And I am out of time. Uh, if you have questions, please let me know. Um, uh, I'm happy to talk about this.